Brothers and sisters, uh, good to see you again. I mean, I can't actually see you through this recorded message. I'm not that good yet. It was my desire to be with you today. Unfortunately, the Lord did have other plans. That was it's his discretionary will on that. He knows the reason. I am able to record this for you. And Lord willing, you will see this and benefit from it at least a little bit. Now, I can't be with you in person, so I'll be with you in spirit. I've got my coffee. We'll be opening the Word of God and taking a look. I've titled my presentation today, looking at the first slide up here, The Gospel for Christ or Me, and then kind of subtitled it, The Use and Misuse of Personal Experience. And what I want to focus on is, when we think about the Gospel, who are we putting at the front of it? Yes, the Gospel tells us about lost sinners. It tells us about the amazing work God has done to reconcile us to the person of His Son, but again, it is to the person of His Son. We have to have an accurate message that draws us to the person of His Son. And then we, in turn, have to go out and live out and share an accurate message that exalts His Son. So going to the uh, slide number two here, why this topic? Well, some things that have been going on for some time now. Western society, especially in the United States, it's already been moving into a kind of a post-Christian era for a long time. Well, now it is moving rapidly beyond post-Christian to what could only be described, I think, as post-rational. The very foundation of reason, that there are facts, that there are truths about, say, gender or the world around us, that we can actually investigate things and come to firm conclusions that enable us to understand how things are put together, how they work. These kinds of basic facts, those themselves are being attacked. And... Only feelings and experiences can legitimately be used to measure truth according to these ideas that are now in our society. And it's not like the ideas themselves are new. People have always been attracted to this idea that I'm the only person who's in charge of my own reality. But now we're seeing it sweep academic institutions, colleges that perhaps many of you are going to or have gone to, but even high school, secondary education. And so the problem here is that Christians too easily bend their faith with the cultural winds. And I see examples of it in my own social circle, in my wife's social circle. I'm sure many of you have experienced it as well. Or maybe, here's the sobering thing, maybe your own thoughts have started to shift in this direction and you haven't really appreciated the fact that the way you are thinking and reasoning about some things that are in your life is not how Christ would have you reason. Third point up there, we must carefully sort our feelings and experiences by an unchanging standard. The gospel can only be lived and shared when it is truly the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing added, nothing subtracted. Feelings are real, but they do not correctly measure reality. But they're very, very strong, aren't they? The other thing in is what about experiences? Well, only experiences dictate the reality of something. Well, experiences give data but they do not provide complete information about what you should be saying or doing. And especially when it comes to the gospel, you can't represent Christ to people if he is based on your feelings about him or based on your personal experiences with him. You may be able to bring some of these things in at the right time and place to help reinforce or illustrate how God has been real and active in your life, but these are not the foundation of the gospel. You have to get that right first. Okay, going to slide three up here. A quick review. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. What does it say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is... Choose one of these answers we've got up here on the board. Answer number A. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of positive thinking for enabling self-improvement. If you thought that was a little funny, so do I, except for this. There are professing Christians today, some may be genuine, who really think that's what the gospel is about. It's about enhancing my feelings, about my self-esteem, taking away the negative in my life and replacing it with the positive. If I feel good, then the gospel has done its job for me, right? Mm, no. Answer A is out. B. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the pathway to divinely appointed health, wealth, and prosperity. Ooh, you know what both of these answers have in common? They appeal to my flesh. They put me, my benefit, my gain, they put those first. 
and tell me, yes, you can have nothing but good in your life from doing these things. Well, what good? Christ is good. Money is useful for a moment, but money doesn't last. It can also lead me into bad places if I allow myself to become covetous and desire more of it just because I want to gain and get. What about my health? Good health is nice to have. I got bad news for you though, even if you have a lot of it at your at the age that many of you are in the audience, that doesn't last either. Things start to break down and fall apart. And I know from looking at my elders that I haven't even begun to experience what the possibilities are. And those of you who are up there yet are like, mm-hmm. Start making a good relationship with your pharmacist. God does give good things, understand. But it it's not the mission of the gospel to just give me a smooth sailing ride here on earth. Answer B is out. Okay, option C. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the affirmation of Western society as characterized mainly by systemic oppressor-oppressed relationships that require social justice advocacy. This is big right now. If you haven't heard at least two or three of those buzzwords in one of your college classes this past month, for those of you who are in college, then you are definitely sleeping a lot. Because these are the things that characterize present society. But friends, there are times when you will have to bear the reproach of Christ precisely because you don't understand Scripture to be calling you to address the issues that in society, some of which are very real, the same way that people in society think you should be doing it. Because people in society do not want to deal with sin unless it is their definition of sin. And the human definition of sin, more often than not, says that someone else has it. Option C is off the table, guys. What about this? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is, option D, the authority for me to rail against sinners for their awful offensive behavior and restore America to godly values at the voting booth. Friends, this is preached from an awful lot of conservative Christian pulpits. That's not the gospel. Just like some of these other options, it has elements of the gospel twisted into it, but only for man's use. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ does tell sinners that they are sinners. But it doesn't just sit there and condemn them by railing against them, because obviously they need to go fix themselves. They can't fix themselves. That's part of the gospel message. Man is lost in sin, and he can't do anything about it. He certainly can't fix it by getting going back to some perception of godly values that existed in the past in society or culture or laws or politics or whatever. Now, if you, in your own conviction before the Lord, choose to vote or participate in any way in the process, okay, fine. We can have a different discussion about that sometime. And since I'm not there in person, you're spared from that this time. But it can't resolve the heart condition. None of these four things can. So that leaves the final answer we've got on this slide. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. You have to have that understanding of the gospel very firmly in your heart and in your mind. Or what you believe about the gospel and how you share it with other people will fall flat. Because at the end of the day, you're not trying to win them to Christ. You're trying to win them to an ideology of some kind. Power of God. It's God doing the work. For salvation, it's a rescue. For everyone who believes. Not if you are the right race or the right gender or the right orientation or at least identify yourself correctly as the oppressed or the oppressor based on society's definitions. Or being too bad of a sinner of the wrong sexual orientation or the wrong this or the wrong that. That's not what excludes you. What excludes you is that you're a sinner. But everyone who believes can receive the gospel of salvation. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed, not a righteousness man tries to conceive for himself. And it is revealed from faith. God gives the faith to understand that this is real and that you need it. And it is given for faith, so that faith may be established, built up, and continue in everyone who receives. That is what the gospel is. And that is why, who wrote Romans 1.16 and 17? Who wrote the whole book, in fact? 
That is why Paul could say that he was not ashamed of the gospel. So moving to slide four here, let's take Paul as an example, some of the things he did. What were his experiences? What kind of feelings did he have or could he have had? And do his actions show that the experiences and feelings were the sole basis of what he was doing? Or was there a greater person that his heart was occupied with? I think we probably know the answer, but let's not just say it. Let's look at the scriptures and establish it. Okay, so first of all, why Paul? Referen the first reference up there is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. I'm going to go ahead and open that up real quick. So if you have your Bibles today, please do and follow along. You never know if I'm using the scriptures correctly unless you look at them yourselves. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. We can have humans as examples to look up to, provided they are imitating Christ. That's the standard. We test to see if Christ is being honored. And if Christ is being honored, then we can look at a way someone might have done something or responded to a situation and said, wow, I don't read about the Lord Jesus facing that specific circumstance in his ministry on earth, according to what was recorded in the Gospels. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It's not recorded. But I see that person, how they reacted to this situation. And Christ was obviously coming out in it. That's amazing. What is it they saw in Christ that caused them to respond that way? How can that help my behavior? So again, don't objectify or idolize the person in front of you. But look at the person who is seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. Gaze upon him and say, yes, I want to be like him. So let's start with what was Paul's past? Acts 5.34 for our first one there. We're not actually reading about Paul here yet, but listen carefully for this name. A Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. What men? Well, the apostles who had been speaking and the council here, the Jewish councils, their ire had been raised and they finally got so enraged that they wanted to kill them in verse 33. But in verse 34, we read that there was a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, who stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a while, and then he calms them down with some very wise words. So keep that name in mind. Acts chapter 7, verse 58. This is not long later. There's a man named Stephen giving a statement. He gives a statement in front of many of these same religious leaders and gives such a powerful testimony to how they had rejected and crucified the Christ that they're just enraged and decide that he needs to die, and so they stone him there. Verse 58, Then they cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as we continue to read in this book of Acts, we discover that this young man named Saul is marked out by the Lord on the Damascus Road, even as he is in the process of ravaging the church. That's, we start reading about that in chapter 8 right after this account. The Lord intercepts him midway through his career, however, puts a stop to that, and gives him a new name, Paul. So turn now to Acts chapter 22. Start with verses 1 to 3. Now here's Paul, much later in his career, speaking before a number of Jews, giving a defense of his position, and he says, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they had heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet, and he said... I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict matter of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness, and so on. And he recounts all the evil he had done, believing, of course, that he was very zealous for God. Looking at verse 27 and 28 in the same chapter, this confirms something about Paul mentioning that he was there, that he was originally born in Cilicia. So the Roman tribune came to him, verse 27, so the Roman tribune came to him and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune said, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. But Paul said, I am a citizen by birth. So what does this tell us about Paul? I've got a summary up here uh, on the um, slide that we're looking at. Well, Paul had the right ethnicity. 
He was born a Jew. Now, if you were born a Jew, you were close to God. You had the law and the prophets. You've been marked out as part of the people of God. You thought yourself, at least, a son of Abraham. Of course, Paul would have to reveal later that only, the only true sons of Abraham were by faith. But to be a Jew meant you had the right ethnicity. You were the one who had it in that day. Gentiles? Ugh. Jews? Yeah. He had the right citizenship. We read that he was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, and then later on discovered that as a result of that, he had a Roman citizenship. So even though he was a Jew, he could move freely about the Roman Empire. But he was from the right city, because although he was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, he was brought up in this city in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the place where God had said he would place his name forever. He had the right teacher, Gamaliel. Gamaliel, a very, very respected Pharisee. Up until the destruction of Jerusalem around AD 70, the Pharisees were one of the groups to belong to. He had the right coursework. Educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. Paul knew what was what. He'd been taught with all of the best resources. And he had the right motives. Being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. What did he do with all that upon meeting Christ? Was all of this the basis by which Christ called him out? And did he just magically lose all of it then when Christ called him out? I mean, was this just wasted life? Let's look at the next slide. So looking at slide uh, five up here, what is Paul's present view of the gospel and his purpose in it? Turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter three, verses four to 11. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul had a lot of experiences. He could speak very plainly about them. And there were things he gained from those experiences that he was able to use. We'll talk about that in a moment. But to the extent that Christ had called him to lose any of this, his position as a Pharisee, gone. <laughs> the Pharisees weren't going to touch him now, or if they were, it was going to be with stones. But... Does Paul regret all that? Is he looking back on these experiences and having feelings of regret, feelings of loss? Man, I could have just been somebody. I could have had a comfortable retirement. Guess I got to serve the Lord. No, no, we don't read about that at Paul at all. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. Why? Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Whatever I've lost, Christ is better than that. Far, far better than that. That was Paul's attitude about his experiences. He could share them. He was aware of them. He knew what he'd gone through. But he also knew that in his flesh, he had also caused experiences for other people. And he's able to talk freely about these. They don't weigh him down. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Let's take a look at those real quick. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, 
that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Paul's thoughts, looking back at these, they're always, always, over and over again, do you see this? They're being directed back to Christ. That was why he could endure so much that he endured during his life. And yet come back around and say, the Lord be glorified for it. One way or another, it was all coming back to him. Not to Paul, to Christ. It was coming back to him. Really, what Paul says about his past experiences here, he's got two more bullet points up here. If Christ can save me, he can save anyone. That's good news. That's the gospel. And likewise, if I could be saved, it could only have been of Christ who done it. We see what Paul was formerly. He was looking for followers of his so-called way. It wasn't called Christianity yet. It was just called the way. And doing everything he could to imprison and kill them. But God had something different in mind. So, two summary points from this as we look at the last end of our slide here. Paul was not holding on to despair about his past. He was not becoming arrogant about his present. He was chosen in spite of his past, and in his present, it was Christ that was to receive the glory. Slide six. That does bring us to a question that we hinted at a minute ago. Was Paul's past experience wasted? He was able to count all of his power and position and honor and everything he lost as gain for Christ. But does that mean his past experience was wasted? Did he have to start over from ground zero? I mean, maybe in some people's lives they do. But if there's something in your past, some kind of education, some kind of experience, a trade you learned, whatever, and you feel God's now calling you to a different direction, he can still use that. He might use it in a different way, but he can use it. One of the most obvious ones is, just look at the slide we've got here, uh, slide six here. I didn't count these. I've got a reference down there in the corner, uh, bible.org slash article slash old-testament-paul. Someone else counted them, but according to their count, Paul's Old Testament knowledge includes at least 131 quotes from the Old Testament. And if you go to that link, actually, I don't know that could necessarily advocate everything on their website, but on that page, at least, they list them out and they talk a bit about them, you know, where they come from and what they mean. 45 quotes are from the Torah, i.e. the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And of course, a lot of those, when Paul quotes from the Old Testament, he's quoting from parts of the law. 53 quotes are from the prophets, including 36 from Isaiah. So Paul had a real interest in Isaiah's prophecy and what that meant for the future of Israel. 23 quotes are from the Psalms, and 10 quotes are from other texts in the Old Testament. So at least 131 times by this count, Paul goes to the Old Testament. Where did he learn to study the Old Testament like that? Well, as a Pharisee, he spent a lot of time looking at the law. Growing up there at the feet of Gamaliel and being trained, he would have been quizzed. He had to spend a lot of time knowing the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. Of course, just like anyone else in that day, except by faith, he didn't learn from just reading them who the Lord Jesus Christ was. But when the Lord stepped in, now then Paul is able to realize, wait a minute, this is the one that all of us has been pointing towards. And he quotes over and over and over again throughout his letters. There wasn't a New Testament yet. Paul was writing part of it at that point. And then in addition to those 131 quotes, Paul regularly references many Old Testament principles and practices without direct quotes. So he wasn't just familiar with little snippets from here and there. He was familiar with the whole thing and was able to put things in context. He understood principles broadly. He understood what they meant. Let that be an encouragement for your own study if you're not there yet. Keep reading the scriptures. You don't get better at recalling passages or understanding broader arcs in scriptures, such as prophecy especially unless you read all the scriptures. Start somewhere, read through that, read through the next, read through the next. Might take you a year to read all the way through the Bible if you want to try and do it that way, but the more times you read any particular part of the Bible, the better you'll get at it. And if you skip parts, like the law, which Paul clearly did not, then you'll be missing out on something. Slide seven, continuing with the example of Paul. So we're still asking, was his past experience wasted? 
Well, there's something else that Paul gained from his past experience that he very much used to preach the gospel. Paul learned how to relate to many groups of people for the sake of the gospel. He, and this was probably a benefit of both his training and his ability to freely travel in the Roman Empire. He read a lot of things. He saw a lot of things. And so we read about um, how he applies that. And this passage can be used and it can be misused. So use godly wisdom when you read a passage like this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, in order that I might win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. So Paul could present himself in many ways, and he's careful to make it clear, no, he didn't sin in order to spread the gospel. So when he talks about being outside the law, well, Gentiles. Now, Paul didn't make his behavior unlawful before God. And by unlawful, I don't mean the law. I mean violating the principles and government that God has for mankind. Paul always maintained his testimony. That's a fine line to walk, and unfortunately, some people abuse this verse to avoid walking that line carefully and say, well, as long as I'm preaching the gospel, I can do whatever I want, look whatever I want, you know, say whatever I want, go wherever I want. No, no, you can't. Ask the Lord for wisdom about what you're thinking about, and then reach out to people. But Paul was able to do that quite freely because he had that past experience. He'd been around. He'd seen a lot. He knew where people were and what they were like in different types of settings and situations and, and local cultures. Interestingly, he was familiar with cultural references and literature, although he never endorses any of them as such. He just happens to quote randomly a few times. One of them is in Acts 17, 28. Well, verse 22, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, and so on. He talks about their altar that they've got out to the unknown God. They had so many altars to various gods that just in case they missed one, they put out another to the unknown God. And Paul uses that as a hook to be able to preach the gospel to them. And in verse 28, for in particular, or 27, he says, Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Now, I didn't find this information. Again, there's a link down there in the corner to carm.org. Carm which you can look up. Once again, external website, don't know what all they teach, but I found this article helpful. Apparently, the lines that Paul quotes there are from poetry by a poet of the time named Aratus. Not of that time, it might have been 300 B years earlier or something, but in any case, this was, a, this was a poetry text that was in circulation still. People read it, they knew what it said. And he takes that and says, look, people can by observation write things that are true. Here's one of them. You all know this cultural reference. Well, that's true. God's not that far from us, but the question is, do you expect to meet him? Let me tell you how, because you want to find out the right way. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 is another. Have you ever quoted some saying or proverb just randomly? You didn't come up with it, but it captures a, an essential truth. What's interesting to me is a lot of those sayings you track them back, they, they're in the Bible. A lot, of, a lot of them started like saying like Proverbs, for example. Well, here's Paul quoting something, but this didn't come from the Bible. Here he is quoting from, some, from an outside text. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Quote, bad company ruins good morals, unquote. You've probably heard that quoted many times since. Well, when Paul quoted it, it was already a local proverb. And it was used uh, apparently by a couple playwrights of that time period. One was named Meander and the other was Euripides. Finally, in Titus chapter 1 verse 12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, ah, he's quoting somebody. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. <laughs> Ow. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. 
So there's an example of, unfortunately, Christians kind of adopting the culture around them. Remember how we started on that point? And Paul goes and quotes one of their own wise men philosopher types, calls him a prophet. That's uh, how they understood him, I guess. But if you go and look up the source on that, apparently that comes from someone named Epimenides. So Paul was definitely aware of texts that were in circulation from popular culture, things people would have been reading, talking about, getting quotes from, repeating things. But interestingly, he's not necessarily endorsing any of it. He just happens to bring these in, showing that he's aware of it. And he uses it, what? To point people toward the gospel. Say, hey, wait a minute. If you as human beings can say and understand and think about things like this, What if there's an underlying truth behind it that you've all missed? What if God is real? What if he is righteous? What if he does have standards? And what if we've fallen short of them? What are we going to do? You better hope God provided an answer and thank God he did. Here's Jesus Christ. Paul does this over and over and over in his ministry. Okay, so looking at slide eight, what about Paul's ongoing experiences now that he was fully captured by the gospel? Were they pleasant? Was everything now a smooth ride? Did he simply get to enjoy his experiences? Did he wallow in lots of pleasant feelings? Well, no. He had to suffer as an apostle. There's a summary of verses here. You can read about these. We'll just pass over these briefly with a summary because of time. But in Acts chapter 14, verses 19 to 20, we read that he was stoned seemingly to death. And then... Seemingly miraculously, he got up and walked away later. But that didn't mean he didn't have to go through a stoning. What do you think that felt like? Was that pleasant? No. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 24. He was beaten illegally by Romans and put in stocks in jail along with his uh, co-minister, Silas. Paul and Silas remember traveling to Philippi when all that happened. In Acts chapter 21 to 32, he was beaten illegally again by Jews this time. Acts chapter 21, verses 33 and following, for the remainder of his career, he was under various forms of arrest by Rome. These started out as mostly house arrest, but in time, towards the end of his life, if you look up historically what sort of circumstances he was in, he was probably in something not much different than a dry cistern in the ground with a guard sitting on top just to make sure he didn't climb out. What about from other believers? I mean, these are just general circumstances there in opposition from unbelievers. But what about from believers? We read about that a lot in 2 Timothy. In chapter 1, verses 15, it says that all they in Asia have turned away from me, Asia Minor. And this isn't just a personal rejection. The statement makes it clear, I think you read, especially in the context of 2 Timothy, that they no longer wanted anything to do with Paul's teaching. So, of course, they wouldn't have wanted anything to do with Paul either. But what Paul taught, according to the truth of the gospel, was no longer interesting to Christians in a whole region of the world. Sadly, we know that Asia Minor, that region, was in fact modern Turkey. And if you know any missionaries uh, working in Turkey right now, I happen to be aware of a couple. The region where the gospel first made some of its greatest inroads and where large quantities of local assemblies were established, is now almost completely without God. There's hunger there. There's reports that when they get to talk to people, that there's genuine interest. But the testimony of Jesus Christ has publicly gone from that region. All they in Asia have turned away from me. Once you start rejecting scriptural truth, that's the long slide downhill until there's nothing left. 2 Timothy 4.10 He's abandoned by a once faithful brother. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has gone on to Thessalonica. Well, if you compare Philemon 124 and Colossians 4.14, when Paul references Demas in those two passages, clearly he's a co-worker, someone Paul can trust, who's going along with the ministry. But by 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, Paul has had to deal with the heartbreak of seeing that man abandoned to the attractions of the world of this present age. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, we see public opposition again to Paul's teaching. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Remember how he posed us. In my first defense, no one stood with me. May God not hold it to their account. 
publicly opposed and deserted. Slide nine. There's quite a bit that goes on in here. Just read it briefly. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 16 to 33. If you haven't read 2 Corinthians in a while, let's just be reminded real quick that from chapter 10 and, and several chapters following, Paul's basically making a defense of his apostleship to the Corinthians. Why? Well, you get the sense that they have been strongly and perhaps somewhat chidingly or bitingly criticizing him. It's like, well, there's been these fa false apostles going around, and we did a really great job of rooting them out. How do we know you're not one of them? Hmm. And Paul, using great patience and a lot of, well, <laughs> a lot of well-targeted sarcasm. You really have to read this in context and, and put some inflection on it to hear it correctly. Chides them back and says, look, the work of Christ has been done in you through the gospel that I preached. Why do you not believe it? We're just looking at chapter 11 real quick here. Verse 16. I repeat, let no one think me foolish. But even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I may too boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. In other words, I'm changing my voice here. I know I'm writing this to you, but I'm changing my voice here, so please try to hear it the way I'm writing it. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. <clears throat> For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it, if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. Sarcasm. You're hearing it? I hope you're hearing it. <laughs> but whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hand of the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, He who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down through a basket in a window on the wall and escaped his hands. He goes on more like this in chapter 12. And was this a pleasant way for Paul to have to respond to the Corinthians? They were so childish and fleshly in how they thought about the situation and circumstances, how they looked at each other and other brethren, and wanted to condemn and criticize them for anything they could think of. And Paul, he recognizes he can't speak to them in calm, sober, spiritual words. He has to sink down to their level so that they can actually hear what it sounds like. It takes a lot of spiritual wisdom to do that correctly. I've, in my lifetime, I've known of a couple of brothers who actually did that. I heard the stories and realized, wow, he was stepping down to someone's level, but he was still speaking with spiritual wisdom. Hope it, hope it got through. And look at chapter nine, the next chapter. In chapter 12, what was Paul's motivation for all this? Verse 19. Was it just so that he could be snide and sneer at them and tell them how bad they were? No, no, it was... Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. Paul doesn't want to have to work with the Corinthians this way. He's been telling them that over and over again. One more real quick in Philippians... 
Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18, Paul is writing about how the gospel continues in spite of the fact that Paul's been now pulled, drawn into prison. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of a selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Look at Paul's circumstances. What kind of feelings could he have succumbed to here? And look at how some of the brethren were acting in response. I mean, the majority, it's good news. They're gaining boldness. It's like, well, Paul has gone through all this, and he's still keeping up the faith. He's still strong in the Lord for this. We can go preach the gospel. If he can endure that, we can endure whatever lies out there, can't we? But there's a few, he says, and Paul somehow became aware of it. They were preaching the gospel because they figured if we keep saying the name of Jesus more publicly, they don't have us. They've already got Paul. So they'll give him a few extra beatings tonight. And Paul knew this. But whatever it was they were preaching, apparently it was the real gospel. And he's thankful even for that. Friends, I couldn't measure up to that. I've wilted under far less than this. And I'm sorry to say I've seen some brothers I loved in the past more than once. Start well, but fail to end well, because they couldn't endure anything like this either. But look at the example that Paul had. Because he was Paul? No. Because Paul was focused on Christ. Looking at slide 10. The gospel, from whom and for whom. Paul is not the gospel. Keep that in mind. We've been spending a lot of time looking at him, but it's not to, because I want to communicate to you that Paul is the gospel. He is not. Paul is an example, not the example. Remember how we started with 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. He was God's vessel to carry the gospel. Ephesians 3, 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. You can read a larger passage and see more language like that. Paul knew that in him was no good thing. As he talked about in Romans, his natural flesh didn't have anything to offer. But because it was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul wanted to know him, Paul was enabled to carry the gospel. And his feelings and his experiences went through some high places, but also some really, really low places. And they didn't dissuade him. He didn't break down and buckle under the pressure. Likewise, I am not the gospel. So much of what is preached today in the name of the gospel is about exalting me, either exalting the person who's preaching it or telling the hearers that they can be exalted by following it. I am saved because of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we come into possession of it, to the praise of his glory. I should also walk according to the gospel. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. As shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The good news is good news of peace. It can stabilize your walk. It can stabilize my feet. My life is to be counted worthy of the gospel. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And, the one none of us wants to hear, 
I may be called to suffer because of it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Paul had to suffer immensely for the gospel. You may be called to also, maybe not in the same way. So finally, what is the gospel? If it's not Paul, but, it's, but he's an example of it. If it's not me, but I'm called to live it. Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. So just a quick summary slide. What have we talked about? The gospel. It is from Christ. It is for Christ. It is about Christ. It tells the good news of salvation to lost sinners. Why? So that they may know Christ. As for us, we have experiences. We have feelings. These are real, but they are not complete information. The gospel doesn't validate them, nor is it validated by them. We should test them instead. As for our experiences with others, well, when we share those experiences, understand these cannot replace the gospel. They may help or illustrate God's working in our lives. I might be able to tell somebody something about how God has worked with me, about the amazing things he's done for me. But God may be working differently in someone else's life. And are you sensitive to that possibility? Can you reach out to someone and share what God has done for you while recognizing that the way he's trying to reach them may be different? Finally, occupy your heart with Christ, the source of the gospel. So let's just close there. And for those of you who are watching this in person, by God's grace, it's happening once again. Yes, there's been circumstances and situations that experiences, if you will, for some of us not being able to get flights, but the Lord knows the reason. And yet some of you have been able to gather together for a time of fellowship, time of discussion, time around the word. Hopefully you're getting some good singing in. And I trust, friends, that you will use that. And let the gospel influence your hearts and lives as you are occupied more and more with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.